Every time a piece of Damascus is made, someone somewhere shits their pants. They can sense it happened and they come straight to the internet to see if there's anything they can do about it. Hello, I'm going to do a quick video on Woot, because every time I forge something Damascus, a small but vocal group of people sweep through the channel calling me an imbecile and tell me that what I made isn't real Damascus and that I don't know what I'm talking about. True Damascus hasn't been made for centuries and haven't I ever heard of Woot's steel. First off, everyone should find a copy of Bennett Bronson's The Making and Selling of Woots, A Crucible Steel in India, published in 1986. It is the Woots Bible. Bronson critically appraises all the literature on Woots up until about 1986. He throws out the bad stuff, explains the good stuff, and then draws some really important conclusions. So I don't think you really know about Woots until you've read this article. At least I was shocked at what I found. It's been referenced in just about every academic paper since 1986. It's very, very important. It's not digitized, so if you do a Google search, it's not like you're going to be able to find a PDF to read. You will find some online library references. If you go to the right one, email the librarian for a copy, and they'll send it to you. That's how I found it. If you want to test the waters on Woot's metallurgy, which is a very complicated subject, check out Anne Feuerbach and her article, Crucible Steel Production and Identification. In general, she's published much more recent articles and a lot of them on Woot's. That paper is also available for reading online. Go look it up. Anything by J.D. Verhoeven and Al Pendre is an excellent source for Woot's metallurgy. These papers are basically a diary account of four decades of researching Woot's and making Woot's. Also, most of that is available online. Point number one, no one is confusing pattern welded Damascus or pattern welded steel with Woots. Absolutely nobody. Nobody who makes it, buys it, or sells it thinks modern day Damascus is Woots Damascus. In antiquity, the word Damascus was used to describe a variety of things, acid etched blades, pattern welded blades, jewel encrusted blades, engraved blades, and yes, Woots steel blades with the famous water pattern in them. Now, some of these items were an attempt to mimic actual Woots Damascus, but we are no longer in antiquity. The 1842 7th edition Encyclopedia Britannica under gun making says specifically that Damascus refers to pattern welded steel used to make gun barrels. A separate textbook in 1858 lays out uh, identical terminology. And since they describe the incredible rarity of Woots Damascus and gun barrels, they are clear about which is which. There's no confusion. There's no attempt to deceive. Damascus was simply acceptable nomenclature for pattern welded gun barrels. And this was clearly in play for some time before the publication of these two books. So anyone who says Damascus does not refer to pattern welded steel is ignoring about 200 years of Western culture, gun making, and knife smithing. It definitely is acceptable to call pattern welded steel Damascus. Number two, Bronson points out that there's a whole bunch of mythology surrounding Damascus. I think we all might recognize that, but he cites two or three reasons for this. The first is that about 150 or 200 years ago, when Europe started writing heavily about Woot's Damascus, this academic echo chamber sort of got started, and people would quote each other and propagate these misunderstandings. No one would really verify information. He also notes that a lot of the people, well not a lot, but a few of the people studying and publishing on Woot's had a commercial interest in promoting some of its qualities. Uh, some of the myths are seen today and enjoy a new life in the mother of all echo chambers, the internet. I've seen academic papers that are well regarded. Uh, articles by National Geographic, Popular Mechanics, Theses, Blogs, Gun and Knife Magazines, Forums, all have some real doozies in them. And there's some examples that he gives. Number one, he says Alexander almost certainly did not get a Woots sword or Woots ingots around 326 BC from an Indian ruler. There's no support for this in literature or anything else. A translation of the passage that this is cited from actually says he gave him bright iron. India had been making iron since about 2000 BC and was probably making bloomery steel at this time, but the earliest crucible steel ever mentioned is in the second century AD. The earliest crucible steel sword that was found is dated from the first century AD. The earliest Woots Damascus sword is dated about the third century AD. There is a site in India that they claim may have made crucible steel, may have made crucible steel, that is currently being dated somewhere between 300 BC and 300 AD. But apparently the evidence doesn't support the site producing ultra-high carbon crucible steel, what we would call Woots. 
So there's virtually no chance whatsoever that Alexander received Woots. Richard the Lionheart and Saladin never met to compare swords. There is no evidence Rome or Europe during the Roman era traded for Woots. The only suggestion that they, they did, according to Bronson, is a flimsy passage in a 1960 book about Damascus steel by Herbert Marion. Bennett Bronson classifies some of those statements as misleading, and others, he says, are completely unsupported. Point number three, prepare thine pants for pooping, but in antiquity, Woots is described as brittle, breaking when cold, contaminated with sulfur, of highly variable quality, and of questionable value. Point number four, this is a long-winded one, but I'm going to touch on it anyway. This is something I found online, but it's an idea that I sort of gravitate to see what you think. Cultures with their own alternatives or sources of iron and steel or their own sort of iron and steel industries did not seem to embrace Woots. Again, Bronson says there's no evidence the Romans were interested in crucible steel from India. Europe during the Roman era, there's no evidence they imported it. And for their part, they had a very long contact with Persia through the Moorish invasion around 700 AD, which lasted a long time, and again for several centuries during the Crusades. This is hundreds and hundreds of years where Europe had direct contact with Wut's weaponry, and we don't hear a peep about it. No one's talking about how superior the enemy's swords are to theirs. After the wars, Europe does not seek to trade in Wut's, nor does it try to reproduce crucible steel. I suppose the Ulfberth swords are a bit of it, a rare exception. I found a paper that references binti steel in China, or B bintai, I don't know how to pronounce it, so excuse that. But essentially, this is China's own encounter with ultra-high carbon crucible steel. They think that it was initially brought in as woots from Persia, and then ultimately China started making their own version through a co-fusion crucible process. The Chinese noted that binti swords were very sharp and durable but about three times as expensive as regular swords. It cost about three months salary for an officer to be able to buy one. They also say that the binti ingots were of widely variable quality and eventually China abandons the co-fusion crucible steel process and the making of binti steel, throwing away sort of an, a, a twig on a branch of their metallurgical technology tree, I guess, because they didn't think that the steel was all that consistent and it was too expensive. Let's talk about the British Empire. From 1500 to 1850, people say this is the golden age of Woots in India. And this is about the time in 1600s when the East India Company begins trading in India. And by 1858, India is basically a subcontinent ruled by Britain. So this is 200, 300 years of ample contact with Woots. They certainly brought some back to study and they published a lot on it. In a few cases, some individuals proposed making surgical instruments or tooling out of woods, but no commercial or industrial scale projects seem to have emerged from this contact. And in fact, in the 1600s, travelers to India note how often India imports European swords in large quantities. The frequency with which European swords with Indian hilts on them are found and that at least one ruler filled their armory with European swords. Point number five. Woots is really probably not a lost technology. We know how to make Woots. Uh, Bronson finds 16 credible and individual accounts of how Woots was made from many different locations in India. It was made somewhat differently all over the place with varying results. A famous sword maker in the 1800s Europe tried to reproduce the highly desirable damascene or watered silk pattern in some forged blades and he says clearly that ingots from one part of India routinely yield the pattern, while ingots from another part, called the District of Salem, are of low quality and do not. So Woots was not a, a single entity. It was really a collection of steels, most likely. Bronson says, other accounts mention that the only Woots really suitable for sword making came from the Hyderabad region of India, which, by the way, is not the region that this sword maker cited as having uh, Woots that would make the, the pattern. Many people make Woots today. Anyone with a homemade foundry in their garage can probably get it done. The trick is making the museum quality woots that carries the famous watered silk damascene pattern. That is quite rare. But people like J.D. Verhoeven and Al Pendre made Dam Damascus woots for decades until Mr. Pendre died in 2017. Jeff Pringle makes desirably patterned woots today, as do other smiths. There are Russian guys who claim to forge authentic bulat effectively. Alpendre said his success rate for making high-quality Woots Damascus was about 
And it seems to me from what I read, and I think Bronson sort of alludes to this, that it's likely there was a low success rate even of the master smiths in antiquity in making the damascened woots that, that we see in museum quality swords compared to the tens of thousands or really hundreds of thousands of tons of woots exported over nearly two millennia there's a relative paucity of museum quality woots with with the desirable pattern in it right a dendritic pattern yes but not not the famous damascene pattern Microscopic and electron beam and neutron particle tricording, whatever, whatever studies are still ongoing with Woots. And we learn a lot without even destroying a blade. We can tell about how the steels were thermally cycled and at what temperatures. They have discovered which direction the ingots were forged out to preserve and promote the development of the watered silk pattern. The hardness of Woots swords, their metallurgical constituents, it's, it's all well known. There's some disagreement as to how the pattern is formed and whether it's depending on alloys like vanadium or sulfur and phosphorus or if certain heat cycling and forging techniques can bring it out of just about any steel. But at any rate, it's been done successfully probably by a variety of different methods. A key point Al Pendre makes is that it was never economically viable for him to make woods. He lost money doing it. He spent more time and money than he ever made back selling anything. He pursued it basically as an interest. There are several theories I found to explain the disappearance of Woots in the mid-19th century. One is that the ore containing the proper amounts of either vanadium and or sulfur or phosphorus or whatever disappeared. They just vanished. They were depleted, totally gone. So that even though you can apply the same techniques that you used to to the Woots ingots, you just never produce the pattern anymore. Another hypothesis is that the stringent laws imposed in India in the 1850s by the British strangled the Indian woots industry almost overnight. I think I read somewhere that about this time, woots production had already been confined to basically Hyderabad and it was on the decline anyway, but I, I'm not for sure on that. Here are my thoughts, I guess, for now, and I reserve the right to change these as I read and learn more. But woots Damascus doesn't seem to lend itself to efficiency or mass production and industrialization. Remember, in 1854, the Bessemer process is discovered in Europe, and so industrialization of the steel industry is definitely underway. Uh, Germany about this time, it is said, is producing better steel than the finest quality Woots. So is it possible that the secrets of Woots maybe weren't lost, but just discarded, like Binti in China? Right now, my take is that Woots Damascus is an impractical, but wonderful and beautiful curiosity that may have occasionally lived up to its fable reputation. I'll read some more and update my opinion later, but in the meantime, you guys tell me what you think about Woots, Woots Damascus, and pattern welding, and why I'm wrong. Do it nicely, but change my mind. 